spring cleaning in the sanctuary. I know you thought we were going to hold, uh, hold out buckets and vacuum cleaners and get a little something out of you before you left this morning, but that's not the spring cleaning we're talking about. If there is one thing about our faith, one characteristic about our faith, which is always profoundly true, and that is that none of us have made it. I don't know. Maybe in high school you were voted in class superlatives most likely to succeed. I know some of you are looking down the aisle right now, and obviously you are seated next to someone in high school who was the best-looking person in the class. Some of us are trying to figure out, do we walk in here as God's gift to First in Calvary, and do we walk in here never having been besmirched by the world around us? Confession is good for the soul. And the psalmist was right in front of the face of God. And in spite of the fact that he was asked to be a leader of Israel... He cried out, create in me a clean heart, O God. Because you see, sin, or from the original language in the Greek, harmatia, does not indicate something awful. It means, literally, that we have missed the mark. Sin is missing the mark. As you page through the history of your life, have you ever missed the mark? Oh, we take great joy in talking about sin. But sin is not about whether you smoke, chew, or go with girls or boys who do. Sin is often our willful. It is not a mistake, because we're all going to make mistakes because we're human beings and we are fallible. But what about the times when we have intentionally missed the mark? And if you're saying to yourself, well, here is one sermon that doesn't have anything to do with me, I'd like to remind you what God's word says to us, John the 8th chapter and the 7th verse. If any of you says that he is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1.18, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Bertrand Russell said, It is in our hearts that evil lies, and that it is in our hearts that evil must be plucked out. This is an amazing collection of people. We get together, we hug, we embrace, we shake hands, and we leave here genuinely with a sense of awe that God has called us to such an amazing expression of the body of Christ. And we keep talking about the worth, the value, the intelligence, the sophistication of people in this congregation. And we have all been gifted with each other. Well, you know what? In the world, we have people who have mastered quantum physics. We have people in the world 
who have learned how to design vehicles that will take us into outer space. We have people in our congregation who can execute a very delicate human surgery and not make errors in the process. And all of us in the last few years, through technology, have been introduced to our amazing ability with our telephones to take a picture of ourselves called selfies, which in our quiet moments we actually call up and look at and congratulate ourselves with how good looking we are. And you and I can read a 500 page book on an electronic device that is a quarter of an inch thick. We're amazing. We are amazing but we are also in trouble. Our television screens every night are filled with threats of beheadings, bedlam, and betrayal. And you know what? We continue to miss the mark. Somewhere along the line, in our ability to gather information and quote unquote get smarter, we've lost ourselves in the process. If we look at scripture, we do not find intimidation, but we do find honesty. In Scripture, we do not find God patting us on the head, but we do find God initiating conversations which are founded in reality. And your faith and my faith is not euphoric because it is embedded in the bedrock of our failures. There are three things that come out of these three verses in Psalm 51 for us to consider. And the first one is the intentionality of sin. The psalmist said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. And you know what? There is no need for mercy, frankly, if you have been voted most outstanding human being in the world. First Kings 8.30, Solomon, speaking in front of the temple, said, Hear the supplications of your servant, of your people Israel. And when they pray toward this place, hear from heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, O oh God, Solomon said, forgive. Because we're not who we say we are. I think my pastoral experience introduced me to the honesty of our humanity over and over again. In this community, I prayed with, I agonized with. I followed him in and out of bars. But there was a promising man in his early 40s who had become addicted and had the disease of alcoholism, and I pled with him. 
that God was capable of taking his hunger and his addiction and turning it around. And the agony is that this man drank himself to death. And in great angst, I performed his funeral. All of us this morning, all of us this morning, are able to say yes or no to God in spite of the addiction in spite of the hell that we think we are in. That is followed up, once we understand that, to a decision to repent. Verse 3, For I know my transgressions and my sins are always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. The prophet Isaiah said in chapter 55, 7, let the wicked forsake his way and evil person in his thoughts. Let him turn to God and he will have mercy on him and will freely pardon Not only is there the need for us to admit the intentionality of our desire to go the opposite way that God has designed for us, but there is also the initiative for us to seek repentance. In the year 1740, in Newburyport, Massachusetts, George Whitfield, an itinerant preacher, stood in front of hundreds of people, all of whom had a religious background, and he called them to repent. When you read the account, it is mind-numbing that those people who believed that they were okay with religion as being part of their environment, but not part of their lives, ran, pushed aside other people, bent their knee in the dust, and prayed that God would forgive them. Which brings us to the acceptance of forgiveness. Verse 7, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Hyssop was a plant that was used in Levitical law for the cleansing of the altar. The priest would take hyssop and would anoint the altar with the fragrance of this plant. And then the Shekinah glory of God could appear. Jeremiah 4, 14, O Jerusalem, wash the evil from your heart and be saved. Hebrews 9, 14, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Create in me a clean heart, O God, if it's nothing less and nothing more than a radical reformation of who we are. 
If you're like me, there are times in life when I have struggled doing the right thing. Why? Because frankly, I turned God off and I turned me on. I wanted to hear more from me than I wanted to hear from God. If you look at the statement of faith on the front of this worship bulletin, you will find that we are here to follow and to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of our lives. That means that as a bond servant to Jesus Christ, not because he twists arms, not because God is mean and nasty, not because God is pejorative in any way, but because the empty tomb is coming. In just a few weeks, we will celebrate the yawning empty tomb which makes Jesus Christ Lord, not of these pews, but of our lives. And that's always the invitation. Reformed theology is built firmly on the invitation for the elect, for people to find that they have been ordained to be loved and cared for by God. And that's our message. The message of walking around downtrodden, dispirited, and discouraged because we're not good enough is not what this morning is about. This morning is all about a prayer, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And then watch God cleanse you out of his grace and out of his love. And he reaches out today. Alas, and did our Savior bleed, and did our sovereign die. That's the good news. Because of him and the empty tomb, we are washed white as snow, and we have been given tomorrow. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing together?